Our next keynote speaker is someone who I'm absolutely delighted has been able to join us today in a very, very, very busy schedule, I know. And that, of course, is Secretary of the Department of Health, Glenis Beecham. Glenis also is a member of our 50-50 uh, by 2030 Advisory Council. We're very lucky. We've got some wonderful, wonderful Advisory Council members. Uh, now, Glenis is, as I said, uh, Secretary of the Department of Health. Previously, uh, she was the Department of Industry and Science, and I think probably the first woman in that role. And previously, or prior to that, was uh, Secretary of the Department of Regional Australia, Regional Australia, Local Government, Sports and Arts, yes. Uh, Glenis has also a very, very long CV, but to cut it short, has also had um, very senior roles in the ACT government, so worked across Commonwealth as well as ACT, and uh, has had a sterling career as a public servant. Which, and she is speaking this morning on embedding diversity and inclusion into workplace culture challenges for leadership. And if anyone can talk about challenges to leadership, Glenis certainly can, because I know she's had a few. Please welcome Glenis Beecham. Thank you so much, Virginia, and I hope she, I think she said had a, 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 long, a lot of challenges in my public service career, so and hopefully I will. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, and before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the audience today. I can shout if you want me to. <laughs> so thank you very much for the invitation and I think it's um, absolutely uh, fantastic to have um, and be a member on the 50-50 uh, by 2030 uh, Foundation. And um, thanks again, Virginia, for your kind introduction and I think uh, Virginia's a great ro role model and something I wanted to talk about in terms of visibility a bit later on uh, as well. So when you look around, I think I've, I know quite a few of you. I see wonderfully successful uh, women and indeed men too. So we need some more, more men in these sorts of uh, functions. And I think um, it's a great, uh, something like this is a, absolutely a great forum uh, to share some of the leadership ideas and gain practical insights into how we can improve outcomes for women not just within your own organisation, but more broadly across the APS. And being on the Secretary's Board, part of my role is to look after that stewardship right across uh, the public service and make sure we're all on sole. Across Australia, uh, women make up 42% of all uh, employees and yet fill just a quarter of the country's executive positions. And whilst you probably know some of these stats that I'll go through, it's really worth going through them on a regular basis because they haven't been changing uh, all that much. And only 16% of non-public sector organisations that employ more than 100 staff uh, on, the, on the ASX uh, have um, uh, women in CEO positions. And just 5% of the ASX 200 listed companies have women as their CEOs. And this stands uh, quite, quite nicely in stark contrast to the Australian Public Service. Half the secretaries now are in the APS are women, and the dynamics on the secretaries board are certainly uh, a lot different, and we do talk about leadership behaviours. We don't talk about men and women, and I think that's one of the things I want to get into a, a bit today. Within my department, and I've only been there since September last year, 54% of senior executive service positions are filled by women, and we're second just behind education and training. And it's quite interesting, having come and worked in both economic uh, agencies and social policy agencies, uh, I think uh, a lot of people would see health, social services, education as, in inverted commas, soft agencies, where of course we have a lot of women. But I can tell you, this is probably the hardest portfolio I've ever worked in. 10% of GDP, the biggest workforce in Australia is health and social services. And if you don't get the economics right in terms of uh, patient outcomes and health outcomes, you've soon got a system that's unsustainable. So what we do is pretty tough. And I think when alongside finance, treasury, uh, some of the other economic agencies, uh, I think health is certainly up there. So I just wanted to 
debunk that myth that, of course, social policy agencies are, have mostly women. 69% of our staff are women uh, in, in uh, the uh, department, and I think that compares to about 59% uh, uh, across the whole of the APS. And I think it is something we should absolutely uh, celebrate, and, and I'm proud uh, to have a workforce with strong female presence, but I don't think we can be complacent and there's always pockets where our female representation is not good enough. Um, the Australian Government is committed to gender diversity targeted women holding 50% of Australian Government board positions overall and with women filling at least 40% of the seats and men at least 40%. I don't know why it's not 50-50, um, uh, however women in the health portfolio uh, comprise 47% of positions on boards. Now why does all this matter? The Department of Health um, has a very healthy number of women in leadership uh, positions, um, but why does that matter? And I think, uh, I think it's all about the sort of leadership we aspire to. And, and sometimes I hear people talk about feminine leadership, male leadership, autocratic, transformational leadership and the like. And for me, leadership is primarily about behaviours. And so we shouldn't be distinguishing, and it would be lovely by 2030, we're not talking about men, women, diversity groups. We're talking about people as people and what we value uh, in terms of leaders and our leadership uh, behaviours. So it would be great when we're not uh, absolutely focusing on uh, women in leadership. And, and that's why I think the 5050 by 2030 Foundation um, is, is so important uh, as well. And as a country, we should aspire to reflect Australia's gender and diversity mix in the workforce, and not simply because it's the right thing to do. And there's plenty of solid evidence that shows organisations from government departments to ASX-listed companies perform better if they have diversity in their workforce and leadership ranks. McKinsey's research found that diversity has the most obvious impact on financial performance when it is found in executive teams and roles that are directly in charge of generating revenue. McKinsey examined over 1,000 companies across 12 countries and found that firms in the top quartile for gender diversity are 21% more likely to enjoy above average profitability than companies in the bottom quartile. Companies in the top quartile for ethnic diversity, meanwhile, are 33% more likely to see higher than average profits than companies in the lowest quartile. The least diverse companies in both gender and ethnic terms are 29% more likely to underperform in terms of profitability, also from McKinsey. And so that's not just for women, it's also, for instance, people from different cultural backgrounds, people with different re religious beliefs, people of different ages, and people with different sexual orientations. Of course it extends beyond this, but the point is clear. Organisations tend to perform better when there is diversity within their leadership groups. And think about it from this perspective. How can an organisation, and I include my department, expect to develop policies and programs that meet community needs if they don't have diversity within uh, our leadership ranks? And when I talk about leadership, I talk about everybody, um, but more particularly in uh, the hierarchical leadership groups. And we absolutely have to reflect the multiple perspectives that exist within communities. Uh, that, we, that we seek to serve every single day. How, and we can't expect to do this as well as if, um, uh, if we didn't have that diverse leadership, you know, particularly in senior executive teams. Uh, we, we absolutely must do better. We've only got two, for example, first Australians at the SES level of about 100, a bit over 100 SES. And that's really not good enough. Either. And on the other side of the ledger, though, we've got four out of our seven people in, a, in my uh, executive leadership team. Um, but our leadership team is less representative of other elements of diversity across our senior executive service. Embedding diversity and inclusion into our workplace culture requires all of us to be leaders. Everyone has a leadership role to play, and it's about behaviours, as I've said. So people at all levels can demonstrate and lead by example. I think it starts with every one of us as an individual. And I've got a pretty pragmatic approach that um, uh, I treat people how I'd like to be treated. And I don't think we can ask more of that uh, as well. 
and rather being prescriptive about diversity targets, um, being prescriptive about giving everyone a go. We all need to abide by basic, these basic leadership behaviours. And a couple that I just jotted down, listening um, is a great skill. Um, meeting protocols. I don't know how many in your organisations have meeting protocols, but we always get other uh, people dominate meetings and uh, others don't get an opportunity to put forward their views. So chairs of meetings should be encouraging everyone to contribute in a meeting and hear the diverse views. And letting and encouraging people to speak uh, is particularly important. And I can remember when I was a junior officer, um, you're shy and retiring and uh, you, you think everyone else knows better than you, but you absolutely uh, have to put your foot put forward and give the opportunity for others to, to speak as well. And I think one of the biggest things is respecting opinions and seeking out different views. And there's sort of a few basic requirements around some of the leadership behaviours, which I'll talk about both learned and embedded in us as individuals. So I think we all need to lead by example in the corridors, in the workplace, at home, uh, in the community. We have women throughout our organisation at all levels and some of them are absolutely inspiring uh, to me, even at the lower levels in the hierarchy in terms of what they do. They contribute to community groups, they've got caring responsibilities, they're chucking kids off to school, they're on a constant merry-go-round and they're absolutely are contributing to the outcomes of the organisation. So I'm absolutely in awe of what uh, some of the men and women are going through at the lower levels as well. So what are we doing in the Department of Health? As I said, I've been there nine months and what's important to me is not just our deliverables but more important how we deliver and what I've instituted in everyone's performance agreement is the deliverables business plan but also what are you doing around how you're delivering? Are you collaborating? Are you building teams? So getting some of those performance indicators which is sort of 50-50 uh, uh, requirement in our SES performance agreements. But my focus has been to focus on, and these aren't, aren't um, rocket science, recruitment and promotion, flexible workplace, governance and board positions, both external and within our organisation, sponsorship, role models and champions, and obviously learning and development opportunities. And I'll just touch on a couple of those. And recruitment and appointment processes, and, and as a department, we're in the process of reviewing the way we recruit to encourage greater diversity on our panels and ensure panellists are appropriately trained. We, we throw people into panels and selection committees, but have we actually trained them? Have we actually had dedicated training on how to undertake uh, those interviews and selection processes in a, in, in a, in a proper manner? And I think... I think I've been watching over, I guess, the last 12 months, two years in my position too, in terms of some of the blind recruit, recruitment that was going on, and I think the jury's out in terms of how successful that's been. And it's, um, I think um, Professor Hiscock, uh, the Harvard academic, has said it's not necessarily effective in encouraging diversity. But there's sort of a step back before all of those processes are embedded in your organisation. And that's more about the willingness and want of people to participate in such programs. You can make any program work as long as you've got the culture and willingness and want to do it. And so for me, that's really important in terms of the culture and the mindset of uh, each and every individual. So I think it's important for people being interviewed to, uh, for positions to feel comfortable. And it's really interesting having been on many, many panels and still being on many panels because um, uh, there's not, not many of us, although now that we've got half, half of secretaries that are women, hopefully it's less, less cumbersome. But um, I think it's really interesting to look and see what people value in terms of interview performance. And obviously interview performance isn't the only thing. And there seems to be a fine line between expressing confidence and being brash. And uh, without making generalisations, I have seen those generalisations being made in an interview context as well. Um, you know, a, a bloke being, and excuse the blokes in the, in the room, um, and this, this is just based on my um, observations, uh, a, a bloke being more forthright and absolutely saying walk on water and the like is, is uh, 
are seen as uh, confidence and if the woman's got the same sort of attitude and forthrightness, it's seen as a bit brash and a bit out there. And hopefully we, that's where I think we need to break down uh, those barriers and indeed train uh, panels uh, to, to look at what to pick up in an interview and what probing questions you might like to ask as well. Uh, so we're encouraging all hiring managers to state also that flexible work arrangements will be considered for every position. And I think that's um, pretty important in, about being inclusive as much as possible. The second area is, uh, is that flexible workplace and organisational cu culture. And we do uh, want to normalise flexible working arrangements and we're fostering an environment where it's acceptable as individuals, teams and the like. And um, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting, um, ministers do it, um, other people do it. I mean, just talking on the phone, a meeting this morning, the minister was in Burnie on the boardwalk and all of a sudden he hooks a couple of us in uh, for a meeting. It might have been 7.30, which is not real flexible working hours, but, um, you know, people can do things um, and they don't necessarily have to be located in the, in the same room. We're also improving the return to work experience and after long-term leave, and I know I was outside of the public service for about eight years having kids and coming back into the service is really, really frightening. Um, you've lost all your self-confidence, uh, you're seen as a second-rate citizen being just a mum, just a mum for eight years, which I was immensely, immensely proud of and taught me a lot of um, uh, skills around negotiating and organising <laughs> and, uh, and the like, but I think I think it's important that we help that transition of people returning to the workplace, both men and women uh, as well. And I can say we've got 28% of female staff in our department are part-time. I think that's a good thing. But only 8% of males. And mm. so my job is to make sure males see this is an acceptable form of work. So then we can have um, that split uh, of females and males um, sharing, caring, uh, and other responsibilities. The other thing too that I'm keen to put in place, everyone has risk and audit committees as, re as required in the public service and we've got a whole lot of other committees in, in uh, our department as well given that we're managing about a hundred billion dollars a year. I've encouraged women to go on risk and audit committees and some of the other governance committees and I think that's important in terms of broader stewardship uh, roles as well. And we've got a ratio of female to male members on our senior executive boards of three to two. Um, sponsorship of women, I think uh, I sort of want to talk a bit about that because that was one of the things that was sadly lacking in my days back in the public service. I didn't really have a champion that I could go to or someone I could talk to about um, a career development, career opportunities and the like. And I think we absolutely need to encourage uh, that sponsorship. Sometimes it's just a conversation. You don't know where to go for information. You don't want to share something in the workplace. It might, seem, might be seen as a, an area of failure, for example. And when you're moving across agencies, and I've got a simple definition of culture is what you need to do to get on around here, is my definition. And sometimes that changes from department to department. And, and I think that's where women and men need uh, sponsors in terms of how to uh, get through the, the mire of, of different cultures and, and people across the service. We've got about 50 mentors um, in the department and externally available to staff mm -hmm. and 30 of those are female. So I think it's pretty important to, to not only encourage people to do it but have an institutional response uh, as well in terms of um, sponsorship for, for uh, women and men. We've got um, also uh, look at, at role models and given that we've got uh, most women in the, in the senior executive leadership team at the moment um, at the DEPSEC level, I think um, being seen and being out there, talking to staff and being visible I think is particularly important um, for role models. I think the more you talk to staff, or the more you're seen to be visible and out there, people can say, yeah, well I can do that too and be part of that group. And I think we've got to do some more about, as I said earlier, about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people from different cultural backgrounds and, and the like. And we've got um, appointed a Deputy Secretary 
to be champions of each of the diversity groups as well. And we do encourage people uh, to, to get together um, and join these staff networks. And I believe there is much merit in, in seeing is believing. It doesn't matter what prescriptions you put out as a secretary, what instructions you give. And I was going through all, all our HR documents and we've got these wonderful frameworks around leadership and technical skills and how to be a public servant. But I don't know how they're being implemented in the, in the teams. And I think that's where we need to get out and absolutely talk to people and uh, act in accordance with the wonderful frameworks we've got out there. So I think the role models and the champions are really, really important to be seen and to be visible. Learning and development, I've spoken about a bit in the, in the context of particular tasks, but um, I think uh, leadership skills are really important and sometimes they're built into us and some skills can still be learned. And when you're talking about communication, collaboration, listening, giving feedback, unconscious bias, I think, and I'm still learning, we still need to be trained and still need to develop those, those skills as well. So I see those elements as an important part of our leadership, leadership training as well. Um, despite the frameworks that I've spoken about and despite what we're doing, one of the things that's concerning me is the female staff entering the senior executive service. I think we've still got uh, an element it takes, an evidence to show that it takes much longer for females um, than males to go from EL2 to SES. And I can remember um, going for my first SES job and uh, one of the, my SES colleagues at the time said, well, you know, you, you, you don't really want to do that. The organisation owns you. You don't have a life and the like. And so it is quite a big step um, to take on a senior executive service role. But um, I'm quite an opportunist and I'd encourage everyone to jump in the deep end um, because there's heaps of support there and even in this network here amongst yourselves, you'll get lots of, lots of support uh, as well. And I, I, so I'm really quite concerned about uh, the tendency among our female staff to question whether they're ready for the SES. And um, one of the things that drove me, I think, when I went out of the public service for eight years, my, my friends, who I thought were my friends, was, um, would say to me, when are you going to become a real person again? Like, you know, get a real job mm -hmm. and, and the like. And I think that's been a little driver on my shoulder. <laughs> that person, I think, is still an EL2 or an EL1 um, that I used to work with many years ago. So it's interesting, some of the drivers that you pick up and personal drivers that you, that you take on. So I absolutely encourage people to, to give it a go. And we've got part-time SES as well. And I think that's um, uh, particularly important. And I think people shouldn't be scared of making mistakes. Secretary downwards, make mistakes every day. Some, of the, some are more public than others, but um, uh, you know, we should be willing to take on those risks and have an environment where supporting each other uh, when we do make, make mistakes. So I'd like to do more about the EL2 cohort uh, going into the SES. And just some takeout messages from me, uh, I think, and I'm very pragmatic in, in approach and would love to get to a, a point where we're not talking about men and women. As I said, we're talking about what we value as public servants and what we value as leadership behaviours uh, as well. And I think it might be as simple as taking more time to listen your colleagues. I think everyone's so busy and uh, you, you hear a lot of people, that, you can, I can hear it in meetings, yes I hear what you're saying, blah blah, well they're not listening at all. Um, they haven't even heard what you've said, that they're, they're just bowling through. So as soon as I hear that phrase, it irks me. So there's a whole lot of other phrases that you should be aware of as well, particularly around I and we too, and you find that a lot uh, in the SES and that's another thing that, that irks me as well. So I think staff should be considered to develop and uh, join staff networks, collaborate and include others. We've all got a responsibility to that. We can't rely on, on the institutional response and the hierarchy. <coughs> Pardon me. Encourage confidence um, and participation. I mean, I, I hate going to estimates committee. Um, I'm, I, I get quite nervous, but you've got to come over as calm, confident, 
on top of your brief and sometimes that does take uh, a little bit of training. So you might be confident in your abilities and the like, but how you express yourself and communicate others may not get that from, from uh, just how you relate to others. So look at that piece. I think also self-development. I'm all for self-responsibility. Leadership is a, a, another simple definition for me. <coughs> Pardon me, and that's your ability to influence others. And like I said, that's where we've all got a, a, a responsibility. And so I think we also should be mindful about our behaviours and language uh, as well. And consider the effect people um, that you work with in terms of what you say might be very differently received from what you're meant to say or, or be interpreted quite differently. So I think um, absolutely being clear about expectations and performance and being clear about what you're saying um, and what you mean uh, is very important. I mean, I, in the public service, I, I mean, we're always talking about nuancing and subtle and the like. I, I like people to tell me straight uh, mm. to my face. Um, so there's mm. none of that dancing around and getting different interpretations of things as well. I encourage people to develop meeting protocols, chair a chair session, uh, uh, rotate the chair. Um, I think that's a, a good thing. So there's some little tips there that we can all uh, take back to our work workplace. And it sounds like um, you've had a great morning this morning and hopefully you'll get a, a lot of insights out of um, uh, today's Leadership Roadshow. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Dennis. I'll get to the stand in for a minute. Okay. Thank you so much, Glennis. Some fantastic material there. I will never say to you again, yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> to the, the, the woman who was just a mother for eight years, goodness me, um, uh, rich material. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to ask some questions. So please, if you do have one, pop your hand up now and a microphone will come your way. We've got two. We'll take this one right here and then one over there. Hi, um, I've just recently discovered that within the Department of Agriculture um, there are some SES positions that are job shared and I was just wondering if uh, that's also happening in the Department of Health and how successful it is. Um, I, I don't know about personally how the outcomes but I used to work with a couple in Department of Families and Community Services where they job shared and I thought we were getting not just two for the price of mm. one but three because they'd go home and Mm. I'm sure they do all their homework together and, and the like, and it was absolutely fantastic. And they were both brilliant uh, people sharing um, young children responsibilities back then. So I think that's great. And I think sharing jobs, not just at the SES level, but other levels. I've seen it happen with EAs, uh, for example. So yeah, it's something that I would encourage. But really, you've got to get the, the partnership right. I guess it is just like a marriage, um, <laughs> too, and the, and the couple. We're actually married to each other. <laughs> <laughs> that does make it easier. In fact, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is true. Their pillow talk was legit. So. <laughs> it is true. You do get two for the price of one, don't you? you do. and, and almost end up with three people because it, I've had that experience of job sharing, which I've encouraged over years and years, and I always feel that they, both parties end up working more and that their handover <laughs> period ends up being you know, a, a double period. Um, we have another question. I think it was just over here. Um, thanks, Glennis. I'm really interested to hear about you um, talking about reviewing your recruitment practices and it actually reminded me of a ARI presentation that I went to earlier this year that was talking about um, recruitment processes and especially interviews were quite a barrier for women yeah. um, and a deterrent for women and I'm just interested to hear your views and on that and what potentially could be an alternative to an interview process per se. And great question. I think, um, I think we do have to encourage women to step up to interviews because when you're talking to ministers, when you're dealing with estimates and the like, you're challenged all the time in terms of getting your point across on a daily basis. So in a sense, it's good training. Um, but I think both panellists and interviewees need to be trained on what to look for and, and how to communicate. So. It might be even worthwhile getting an independent person on panels uh, to look at, okay, so how's this, is this uh, panel working well? Uh, and I, I, I think I've only done that once in the past, 
Um, but I think particularly when you've got big recruitment rounds and the things and things like that, it can get uh, very um, intimidating. I think that I think you have to absolutely train yourself and be trained and put yourself in front of a panel, um, even though we might not like it. I mean, I've been in front of heaps of interview panels and been kicked in the guts many times and lost lost jobs, but it makes you stronger and more resilient as well. Interesting to hear you say lost jobs. Would you agree that all good careers have that roller coaster or need that roller coaster ride of actually falling over, losing positions, and then learning how to rebuild yourself? From my personal experience, yes, I do. Um, and it's interesting, one of the panellists that interviewed me was Jane Holton, and she, she asked me a question in an interview, not in her portfolio, is um, give me an example of experience where the hairs on the back of your neck have stuck up. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, so she, wants, she wanted to know, have I done some really tough things and how have I responded? And so things, when you are confronted with those sort of things, uh, I think it makes you a much better person. I mean, you can be a public servant and keep your nose clean and not do anything and not be challenged. For me, that's not enjoying your career or life journey. But you're also not going to get very far, are you? No, not if you're just sitting there. And, yeah. and uh, just one last question. Unless we've anyone got a burning question? But I can't help but ask this because I, I know that you went through a really difficult period at one stage when you were working for the ACT government where there was a lot of media about you and you were splashed all over the, the headlines. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you... <laughs> Thanks for raising yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's why I said I had to ask it. You handled that extraordinarily well. How did you do that? Um, Looking back, I think you just go through the process day by day and the most hurtful thing about that was not me personally, but my mum and dad. <laughs> what would they think of me? And his, as a public servant, you know, you do your best that you possibly can in the public interest. And when you've had a couple of deaths in a disability home, you do take responsibility for that. It doesn't take an inquiry to do that. And in a sense, I thought there was going to be good come out of it. And I thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? I'm still here. <laughs> and I, in the end, I ended up um, being a deputy in the new disability and housing mm -hmm. department after that horrible process. And, but also had a whole lot of people come out in support. And mind you, I well, was four months into the job mm -hmm. um, when there was a couple of people died in a disability home, which was really, really tragic. And so... And I you unfairly were copying all the blame. Yeah, yeah, and I was in the position... Bloody media. I was in the position... No, well, I was in the position that took responsibility and, and did indeed take responsibility, but you just worked through it on a day-by-day -day basis. Yeah. As you did. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Glenis Beecham. Thank you.